Let's do it. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, we have a nice audience here today. And uh, um, thank you all also for the people joining online. Um, so this is our October um, seminar of the New South Wales uh, branch of the Statistical uh, Society of Australia. Thank you all for coming. So we will start in a minute, but before starting, um, I would like to, in the spirit of reconciliation, um, the Statistical Society of Australia, in particular the New South Wales branch, acknowledges the traditional custodians uh, of the country, that is uh, Gadigal people, for those of you who are in Sydney Uni at the moment, uh, and their connection to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So, um, we, uh, it's my pleasure to have, uh, to introduce uh, here today, uh, Professor Brian Collis, uh, um, who is Professor of Biometry, of Biometry at the University of Wollongong. Having been appointed to this position in July, 2011, after working as a biometrician for more than 30 years uh, with the, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. He has led numerous large-scale industry projects and has extensive experience uh, in the management of large teams of applied statisticians working across multiple research and consulting projects on behalf of the Center for Biometrics and Data Science for Sustainable Primary Industries. And in his previous role as the um, Director of Biometrics in the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry. His interests relate to the application of statistical approaches to the analysis of agricultural and biological data, he has co-authored more than 210 refereed papers. Much research involves the application and development of linear mixed model techniques. And he is a co-developer of the EAS REM and EAS REM R software system. He has successfully supervised over 25 master and PhD students as a trained developer and mentor the majority of statisticians currently supporting the grains industry with Australia. He is also the recipient of the EA Cornish Award in 2015, an award for recognition of a member in the Australian region who has given long-term service for, to the Biometric Society and to the advancement of biometry. He is a past co-editor of Biometrics and past associate editor of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Statistics, and is currently co-editor for Frontiers in Plant Science, Plant Bioinformatics, and associate editor of the Journal of Agricultural Science, Cambridge. So he's going to talk today <coughs> um, about the um, optimal design of comparative experiments using the ODWR package, an application in plant breeding. Thank you very much, Brian, to be here today. And just before starting the seminar, I just uh, um, ask you all to um, like just to reduce uh, the um, noise, uh, to mute yourself. Uh, and uh, there will be time at the end for questions. Is Thank you very much. Pointer? Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. and one, a small one backwards. Right. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, I think it's not like, yeah. You know, should work. Yeah, um? click on the slide. Oh. And then, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Clara, that lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so I'll get into it because I'm running a bit late and I am just got here and so we may as well get into it, which is good in one in one respect because um, that means I haven't got time to tell any jokes or misbehave, so I'll get straight into it. Uh, the topic of my talk today obviously is on the, the design of experiments. Uh, I'm very passionate about experimental design. Um, I, I was going to make some cheap comment about you know, experimental design is not dead, it's still alive. Hopefully, at the end of this talk, you'll uh, you'll share uh, some you'll have some insight into why I feel experimental design is still uh, alive and kicking, and it's very very productive and fertile area uh, to get involved in. I'd like to thank uh, my two co-authors uh, co um, for the contribution today, and you'll see uh, yeah you'll see why. Uh, <clears throat> before I start, obviously Clara has said that I'm very heavily uh, involved in in industry. I have been all my life, uh, my working through, uh, life anyway, and um, I want to thank all the plant breeders who have been very helpful um, and brave enough to implement some of the ideas uh, that you'll be seeing today, particularly thanks to the grain, uh, Australian Grains Technology, Intergrain, and all pulse breeders. 
Special thanks to Christy Hobson, uh, who's uh, in Chickpea Breeding Australia, and William Fairley, who works for AGT, for providing some examples, and Callum Watt for motivating the work on the reduced animal model, which I won't have time to present today. Anyway, let's jump into it. <clears throat> so there's been major advances in the analysis of multi-environment multi trial data, which is an acronym which we use as MET data sets, uh, which encompasses uh, all stages of a plant improvement program. It's been uh, obvious for some time that this factor analytic linear mixed model, um, which has got the acronym of an FALMM, which was first proposed by Alison, uh, myself and Robin in 2001, consistently provides a good fit to this MET data set, these types of data. Most uses, uses of the uh, factor analytic mixed models in plant breeding incorporate some form of genetic relatedness, either using a numerator relationship matrix or a genomic relationship matrix. Um, and there's a reference there to one of my, my papers in 2014. Maximal gains from the use of the factor uh, analytic mixed models only will occur if the MET data set has been constructed and designed in an appropriate manner. There's been very little attention given to the design of MET data sets and even less uh, which utilize genetic relatedness. Classical approaches to design are incapable of constructing optimal designs which include genetic relatedness and cater for the constraints which exist in the design of design of METs for early stage selection. Some of these issues include seed supply issues, resource allocation constraints, and optimal al allocation of genotypes across sites. I'll be a little bit loose with the terminology here. Hopefully you'll understand the similarity between um, something I call a genotype and I might call it a breeding line, I might call it a variety. So it all they all are synonymous. Um, Model-based designs provide the only sensible framework for the construction of designs with the desirable and required properties. The paradigm is to use a computer intensive search of a design space or the design space to generate an optimal design with respect to a pre-specified uh, model, which hopefully um, is close to the model that's used for the analysis. ODW is a freely available R package which constructs optimal designs under the linear mixed model framework and generates design designs for a wide range of problems. Um, well, there's six examples there. It can generate classical designs such as Latinized row column designs. It uh, easily copes with uh, the partial replica designs that I um, came up with in 2006 with Nelson and Neil, with or without genetic relatedness, and so it goes on. Okay, so we'll be covering a few of these things today. The motivating example that I'll be covering today. Um, is a multi-phase design, which is uh, which is a little bit off the wall, but it's really quite interesting. I'll then talk about a brief history um, of optimal experimental design. We'll cover model-based design using the linear mixed model with correlated treatment effects. And then we'll give some examples. I was going to give uh, quite a few, but um, luckily for, for, for the long-suffering audience uh, here, you'll only get two examples. <laughs> and then um, oh, hopefully we'll just have a very, very quick overview of an incomplete MET design. It'll be very quick. All right. Motivating design. Uh, sorry, motivating example. It's a multi-phase uh, experiment uh, in wheat quality. So a little bit of the biological background. Uh, the enzyme alpha amylase is responsible for the degradation of starch into sugars in wheat grains. If it occurs at higher levels, it, it reduces the end product quality of the grain. <clears throat> and the falling number test is an internationally accepted standard as a field-based surrogate for assessing suitability of grain for human consumption. Grain samples which have a falling number less than 300 seconds are downgraded from zero. Falling number does not directly measure alpha, A's, uh, alpha amylase content in the grain, but it measures changes in the physical properties of the starch portion of the wheat kernel caused by alpha amylase. <laughs> falling number requires uh, what's called a multi-phase experiment with two phases. The varieties are first grown in a field experiment, which is phase one. And after this uh, has been harvested, the grain samples from individual plots are processed in a laboratory experiment, which we call phase two, to obtain the trait of interest. Several authors, including Chris Bryan in 83 and, and Alison in 2006, have uh, stressed the need for the use of a valid experimental design for all phases of a multi-phase experiment. Multi-phase experiments uh, occur in many, many other applications uh, other than just in agriculture. And it, it's worthwhile reading some of Chris Bryan's work. Uh, he's been very, very productive in this area. However, this rarely occurs in practice. And one of the most um, the major impediments has been the lack of suitable software to generate optimal designs. Here we use ODW to generate an efficient design for the seemingly complex scenario of a multi-phase experiment. 
Phase one of this, um, this example involved a field experiment uh, comprising 144 plots arranged in a rectangular array of 24 columns by six rows. A total of 105 varieties uh, were grown in a partially replicated design in which 39 varieties uh, are planted in two plots, while the uh, remaining 66 are planted in single plots. In this example, there is no information on the genetic relatedness of the varieties, so that the varieties to be replicated will be chosen at random, which is, uh, yeah, you'll see later. Uh, a pictorial view of the uh, experiment is given in that figure there on that slide. It's a PREP design with replicated varieties resolvable with respect to column blocks. So column blocks are denoted as C block one, C block two. And so those varieties that are in uh, orange, I'm colorblind, but hopefully you can see, those varieties in, uh, in orange are the ones that are replicated in the dark, uh, darker color, sorry, the lighter color. Um, we expect extraneous variation aligned with rows and columns due to agronomic practices. Phase two, uh, the, the laboratory experiment in phase two takes the, uh, the grain samples and turns them into a slurry. Uh, and each of those slurries is then placed in a tube on a falling number machine, which then measures the trait, which is the time taken in seconds for the rod to travel through the slurry. In this experiment, samples from all 144 field plots uh, were processed and replication in phase two is achieved by producing two slurries from two separate grain samples for a subset of the field plots. As with the field experiment, a partially replicated, which I denote Q, rep design, will be used to reduce the cost and time. In phase two, 40 plots will be tested using two slurries, while the remaining 104 will be tested as single slurries, making a total of 184 slurries to be processed. The choice of plots to be replicated in phase two can be made in an, an informed manner using ODW and an, an appropriate model. The slurries will be processed using two falling number machines, each of which comprises two tubes, this allows four slurries to be processed simultaneously, and these will be referred to as a run. Thus, the full phase two design requires 46 runs, which are processed sequentially. Practical considerations necessitate the grouping of runs into blocks with no more than eight runs in each and, each, and three blocks per day. The full de uh, design spans two days, and the, final, and the final block on each day will have seven rather than eight runs. That's a mouthful and it would be very difficult to take it all in. So what I've done uh, is presented that you know, in a uh, diagramic uh, uh, form for you. And you should be able to see that there's a total of um, 46 runs going down there. And those runs are indexed by days and run blocks and then runs within, uh, within there. And there's two tubes per machine and machine one and machine two. And so basically those four, that first row gets processed sequentially by a very, very busy little chap who runs backwards and forwards and takes all those measurements and sets up the machines. And uh, then Will does the same again and again and again. So that's how it's processed. Okay. Oh, hang on. Uh, we expect variation from machine, tubes within the machine, run blocks and runs and days. Okay. And so our main objective there is to come up with a, uh, uh, an allocation of the uh, varieties to those, those plots in phase two, uh, which is optimal in some sense. Okay. All right, that was a motivating example. Optimal experimental design. Definition. An optimal experimental design is, what, is one that is optimal with respect to a statistical criterion, Cal O, based on some measure of the treatment information from an assumed statistical model. The scope uh, is our primary interest is uh, with categorical designs, where the effect of qualitative factors on a response variable is under investigation. The theory of optimal design is usually presented in the context of response surface type designs, but the principles and the results hold through uh, the computational methods differ. So just to set the scene here, we're gonna just take an incredibly trivial example and just take you through a little bit of the, some of the concepts uh, that, I'll be talk, that I'll be talking about later. So the model we choose for illustrative purposes is just a, linear, it's just a simple linear model, where tor is a n by tor t vector of fixed effects, x is the associated design matrix. We assume to be full rank, e is the n by, one vector of errors, assume normal, mean zero, variance sigma squared, phi. Hence, uh, we all know that the uh, least squares estimate, y hat, is x tall hat, where tall hat's given by that formula. We also know, we're very familiar with the fact that the variance of tall hat under those assumptions is that, the variance of y hat is given by that quantity. And the variance of tall hat quantifies the available information uh, on treatments. Given an objective function f, um, then O is, uh, is equal to f of c minus, where c is given by x transpose x divided by sigma squared. 
And our, our objective here is to choose an X which minimizes this uh, objective function O. Um, a brief history now. Uh, there's been extensive theoretical development uh, way back in, uh, in the early uh, 1900s by Smith and Wall. Computational foundations attributed to Kiefer in 1959 and Cox uh, gives a very useful introduction to optimal experimental design. A design can be specified by a probability measure Xi with a unit mass over the design, matrix, design region DC such that if omega indexes one to n are the design points with weights uh, between naught and one, then uh, this um, probability measure Xi at, uh, evaluated at omega equals naught if no observations are at omega. Otherwise, uh, Xi omega is, uh, is W omega if observations occur at omega. Note the following uh, Rajmi Bailey's uh, wonderful textbook on the topic of comparative experiments. The transpose of the design matrix X uh, given by X tor is indexed by uh, those uh, column vectors X1 up to Xn, where X omega is an N tor by one vector. The design second moment, written as M Xi, is given by that, uh, that expression of that integral is proportional to the Fisher information matrix. Okay, I'm sorry I'm racing through this a little bit, but I've got a lot of material and I want to get to my examples. In the theory of optimal continuous design, the general equivalence theorem of Kiefer and Wolfowitz in 1960 states that if O is a, uh, is a function of M, is a criteria to be optimized, then O is convex and differentiable. And we assume that O is convex and differentiable, then number one, the optimal design denoted Xi star minimizes this objective function. The minimum is of the derivative of O, O dash, evaluated in Xi star is greater than equal to naught. Differential of O evaluated in Xi star achieves its minimum at the design points and any minimum found will be global. Some common optimality criteria include the so-called de-optimality measure, which is the minimum of the determinant of M Xi to the minus one, G optimality, which minimizes the maximum of the variance of Y hat, and the A optimality criteria, given by that expression there, which is the minimum of the trace of M Xi minus. If it follows from the general equivalence theorem that a de-optimal design is also G-optimal. The general equivalence theorem applies strictly to continuous exact designs. Discrete designs uh, whereby the, you know, the weights um, W omega are equal to R omega over N, where R omega is an integer, typically one, uh, are the case that we're more interested in. Standard calculus does not apply in these situations and continuous designs are mainly of theoretical interest. In, in practice, we have two options, or at least two options. Okay, the practical options are to find an exact solution and resolve this to the nearest integer, or use the summation approximation for M uh, Xi, uh, where M uh, Xi turns out to be equal to X transpose X over N, the, the measure that we are very familiar with in the design, in the design space for a linear model. And the measure uh, Xi bar assigns unit mass at the design point omega. Good. The optimality of continuous designs can be proven, whereas a, a computer search is generally necessary to establish the optimality of a discrete design. When comparing discrete designs, the relative values of, um, of O are important, not how well uh, Xi star approximates Xi star. Xi bar approximates Xi star. Good. Some general principles about computer generated discrete designs. In practice, all designs are discrete and fall into two classes being res res response surface designs and categorical designs. Some of the common elements between these two classes of designs, one, they both share, a, well, not necessarily, they both have a statistical model. They both have a design reason D and a starting configuration Xi of naught. Response surface designs have an optional set of um, candidate points in, in D, an exchange algorithm to swap or, uh, or add to rows of X uh, with Xi or exchange a single element x omega alpha with a neighbor uh, with a neighbor in d categorical designs which is the ones that we focus on uh, require an interchange algorithm to swap rows of x and iterate the exchange exchange interchange policy over d to be in the design space sure right that was a very very quick history of um, optimal design theory we consider the construction of designs now under the following model this is the linear mixed model, uh, which is just an extension of the previous linear model, where now we have um, some random effects in there, ZU. The other, I think all the other matrices are the same. The important difference here is that we don't, do not assume that X is full rank. In fact, we, uh, we 
we have a, general, a much more general uh, setup than before. In order to explain how ODW uh, operates, we need to reorder the elements of uh, beta, which are the fixed and random effects in that linear mixed model, tor being the fixed, u being the random. And we, and we write that previous equation uh, as y equals uh, w beta plus e. It's a mouthful here, so it'll become clear on the next slide. So w is w1, w2, w1 is partitioned further into w11, w12, w11 is partitioned into x11, z11, and w12 is partitioned x12, z12. w2 is uh, partitioned in x2, z2. This is to allow for complete generality where, right, W1 is the design matrix for the set of what we call permute effects, which are denoted by beta 1, fixed and random effects impacted by the exchange policy, denoted by P. So this set uh, of commute effects is denoted by P. The design matrix for the set of static effects, which are these beta 2s, which we denote by S, obviously, P stands for P, S, uh, sorry, P stands for permute, S stands for static. Um, these are the static effects. Uh, and the intersection between P and S is a, is a null set. Typically, um, the static effects include terms associated with the plot structure and other extraneous uh, various factors. W11 is a design matrix for the set of what we call objective effects, um, which we write O. O is obviously a subset of P, hopefully it's obvious, contributing to the optimality criteria or to the computing of the optimality criteria. W12 is a design matrix for the set of linked effects, L, L are also a subset of P, it's not contributing to O, and um, an O uh, union L is P, and O intersect um, L is the null set. The random effects uh, and errors are assumed uh, jointly normal. With that distribution, we have um, U1 is various matrix G1 and so on. G1 and G2 and R are positive definite matrices assumed to be functions of, un of some unknown variance parameters. Uh, Model-based design requires values for those various parameters. Uh, in the following, we, we regard them as known. Either we have some, some defaults in the package or the user can supply values given the application. The full set of mixed model equations given, uh, can be written succinctly by that, where the coefficient matrix uh, on the left-hand side there, C, can be written as that nasty looking uh, equation there, which I won't go into. Hopefully you get the flavor of what's going on. Um, and all those uh, matrices are defined there. What we then do is we uh, undertake an absorption to get a reduced set of mixed model equations for only the permute effects. So we absorb up, we absorb up those things in the previous slide. So we're absorbing up those bottom rows, uh, and we absorb up those, and we get a reduced set of equations for the uh, for the things that are of interest. The criteria is a function of the so-called um, coefficient matrix C11 in that equation there. So that's that's the base that we have to uh, work with in ODW. We, we do this absorption once at the start um, of the design search, and then we use some clever tricks you'll see in a minute to, um, uh, to process uh, through the design space. ODW formalizes the design process by encapsulating the appropriate statistical model in an R formula object. Uh, that's, this is a pseudo sort of looking co uh, call to ODW. The whole swag of um, arguments, which I'll go into in great detail through the talk, so I won't dwell on that. The important things uh, are is that the fixed formula contains possibly things that are in the permute and the static. The random also uh, contains things that are in the permute and static. The permute defines the permute terms, uh, which is the union of the objective and the link, and so it goes on. Okay. Uh, prediction and optimality criteria. Um, if we're interested in predicting a, uh, an n by an n by n um, pi by one vector of decimal functions, and we assume d is a known matrix, um, then it follows that, um, that the distribution uh, for known variance parameters of this quantity here is given by that. And lambda, capital lambda, is uh, known as the prediction error variance of, uh, of this, uh, this, this quantity, which is given by d, c to the minus one. Uh, C minus, sorry, 1, 1, D transpose. A optimality is the appropriate uh, measure that we use for plant breeding trials as it minimizes the risk of incorrect selection. And the bottom uh, the point there gives a, a full formula for computing A from the prediction error variance matrix. Computationally, um, it's written, it can be written like that. 
Unfortunately, the current uh, version of OVW only allows um, uh, D to be a, a very simple form, but Dave and I have got plans for the future to generalize uh, this concept into a prediction set. Rosemary Bailey defines a design uh, as a function T from uh, omega to, to T uh, cal, being the whole set of treatments, being the whole set of treatments. Thus, plot omega is allocated T omega. Here, it's convenient to consider a design as a permutation vector P, which orders the rows of W1 with a notional permutation matrix cal P. Reordering the rows of P cal P provides a convenient mechanism to dynamically alter the mapping return by this treatment function T. Formally, a design instance uh, XI is then just simply given by cal P times W1. If P1 uh, is a row per perturbation of P, then a new design XI1, which is represented by P1 W1, uh, can be formed. In practice, um, this operator here uh, interchanges two rows of W1, and XI is represented in P. It's a very, very uh, smart way that Dave uh, has implemented this because it saves a lot of space and memory by just keeping this this uh, perm permutation vector P. So that's the thing that gets stored uh, within the program. An undirected search uh, flow chart, if you like, of what's going on under the bottom of OD is presented here. We begin with a permutation, which is a null permutation or the initial permutation of uh, being the number N, obviously. We compute uh, an initial A value from that. We increment i to well, we set i to be naught. We then go through this loop here where we increment i. We we perform an interchange. We compute the um, the a optimality. We, we compute the uh, prediction of variance matrix for that um, quantity pi uh, tilde. We then we then compute the i uh, optimality criteria for that new design, and then we just jump into this green box here. If a i is less than a i minus one, if it's yes, then we go around. If no, we stop. And so we keep going around, 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 around until we either run out of time, we run out of interest, or it, or ODW hits the max it. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, there is no known, um, there is no no known upper bound or lower bound, as it happens uh, in these complex uh, designs. So it really is just a case of letting OD spin around and search the design space. Um, ODW does do that in a very, very clever way. Uh, Dave has, has implemented this taboo or reactive taboo search algorithm, which was uh, described and discovered by Glover in 1989 and 1990. And it's a very, very efficient uh, algorithm. We also update the coefficient matrix in a very smart way. The original work was um, proposed by Richard Martin and John Emerson in 92. Dave and I, uh, our colleagues, uh, came up with a, a more modern version of the same algorithm, which, uh, which allows for correlated treatment groups. Which speeded up the program enormously. Right. Okay, we have an example. I think I'm on time almost. Sorry about all that being a rush, but I've got a lot of material to get through. This is where we have hopefully a bit more fun. Uh, well, I'll have more fun because I'll show you how clever uh, OD is. I hope. <laughs> well, maybe I won't. Taken from this is taken from a real example. All my examples are real. Um, taken from a real uh, real example from an incomplete met design. And you think, well, what 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 on earth is that? Uh, which was generated for the stage one genotypes. So stage one genotypes are the genotypes that are entering the uh, you know, the major uh, yield testing stage of the program. So this is where breeders have made all their crosses, they've generated enough seed, hopefully, to sow a small kit. And there are typically thousands and thousands of these to uh, evaluate. And the environment is extremely heterogeneous. Well, you can imagine what's happening this year. Uh, I think poor Christie's having a heart attack because she's losing all of her experiments. Um, all these lovely trials that we sowed back in um, June are probably underwater at this point and getting washed away. Anyway, so the full MET design that I designed for Christie had seven sites, 4,240 genotypes. And the full design included two home sites, probably both under, underwater now at Narrabri, on different soil types, one for the adapted varieties from the north, the other for the southern adapted um, genotypes. There were two northern and three southern satellite sites. Home sites include all the genotypes. Satellite sites typically only include subsets of genotypes because typically they're constrained by seed, um, seed constraints problems. Seed supply in chickpeas is a big issue. Um, you just can't get enough seed from these little, little things uh, early on. So there's a really big issue about how to use the very limited seed we've got and also land, land availability. As an illustrative example, 
Um, I'm only going to use the Narrabri home site, which has got 1,280 plots. I've had that many, and Christy had 1,139 genotypes um, at that site. Um, and, I, and therefore, the only sensible option here is to use these partially replicated designs uh, of mine. Okay, so just a little picture of the experiment. There were two management blocks. Well, that's what breeders like to call them. Oh, sorry, I call them management blocks. Breeders like to call them trials for some bizarre reason. And two uh, column blocks. So we have we have um, the green is uh, is what I would call um, you know um, management block one, management block two, and then we block in the other direction. Sort of columns, uh, column blocks one and column blocks two. The plot sizes are basically uh, two meters by ten meters. So that that direction there is roughly two hundred meters long. Trial blocks are thirty-two by twenty, and columns are sixty-four by ten. Good. Okay. What we're going to do is illustrate the design construction for a PREP design, uh, and this almost always involves two stages. Stage one, well, it, it does now. It didn't in the past, but now it does. Stage one, allocation of packet choice status, that is, do we do, given seed supplies, do we, which varieties do we assign uh, one packet to and which uh, do we give two packets to? And when I'm talking about packets, I'm talking about packets of seed and packets is synonymous with what's in the experiment. So it's a little packet of seed, they tip into the sewing machine and away it goes and sows them, right? Stage two is the allocation of plots to genotypes given whatever packet choice status you've chosen for a particular genotype. And because it's a partially replicated design, we can't do that with every variety. We can only uh, replicate a small number of the total 1139 varieties. Each stage uses a different core to ODW. So getting down to the numbers that we have to deal with, <clears throat> 462 genotypes had sufficient seed to be considered in two plots. Okay, this is the problem that Christy faces every year. The breeder stipulated that she wanted this thing called CBA Captain. A little aside, as an interesting uh, ditty, the fellow who's a lovely friend of mine and he's still alive, Ted Knight, is an absolute cricket uh, tragic. And so every variety that's released by the CBA breeding program since, since the year dot is called after something to do with cricket. So CBA Captain, we have PBA Seaman, we have PBA Hattrick, we have PBA Boundary, we have PBA Maiden, and so it goes on. Sorry about that. It's a little true story. He's a lovely bloke. He's since retired. And so, Christy, to honor Ted, uh, Ted was the first guy that actually produced chickpeas in Australia. Quite a wonderful thing to do. Lovely man. Anyway, to honor that, uh, Ted, she was maintaining this lovely tradition. And where was I? <laughs> that was a good distraction. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christy said that she wanted Captain to be sown in two plots because that's typically what bird is like. The swap uh, SWP is a factor with three levels to be used in the swap as the swap factor. PC is a bizarre thing, but it stands for packet choice. I'm sorry about that. Packet choice is a factor with two levels to set up the following variance model. The packet choice factor. The two uh, the two way contingency table between packet choice and swap is given here. So captain has to be in packet choice two. Genotypes with um, only enough C for one have to stick stick in that uh, particular spot. And this is where we have some choice. This is where ODW will find the optimal set, the subset of that many varieties. Uh, uh, which, which gives us a lower A value against a particular linear model. So in the absence of genetic relatedness, this subset could be determined using simple random sampling. However, because we know the pedigree structure of the, uh, of the lines, we can do better than that. And what we do is we consider an interim linear mixed model uh, for a pseudo data vector of length number of varieties, which is uh, 1139 here, which has a very simple structure. It's just an overall mean, it's just got a genetic effect and, and some error term. We decompose the genetic effects uh, into additive digital uh, genetic effects. And then what we do is we just plug that into that linear model and we come up with this uh, model here, which has got an overall mean, it's got an additive genetic effect and we've got a slightly different looking um, error vector or precision, uh, what I should call an error vector, which is the sum of the, of the two bits, the, the UE and the uh, beta. The distributional assumptions that we have about UA, UE, and ETA are that we assume uh, that UA, uh, the, the variance matrix for UA is, is a constant times uh, what we know as the numerator, numerator relationship matrix. So basically, you can just form uh, A from, from the pedigrees. So knowing the mums and the dads and the great granddads and so on, so on, so on, you can form that matrix. 
And particularly breeding programs like all breeding programs has very strong family structure, really, really strong family structure. Breeders always go back to reliable parents and, and they make crosses between reliable parents. Hence, that's a very, very uh, dependence in that. Uh, in the R matrix is a direct sum uh, in this case, from one to one up to two, of sigma squared divided by R, where, where N1 plus N2 is the number of varieties. R1 is um, one and R2 is two, because I've, I've either got means of, I'm either looking at means of one replicate or I'm looking at means of two replicates. Okay. So that's effectively what I'm doing here. I'm, I've come up with this pseudo uh, mixed model, which reflects um, how I should allocate varieties to, to, the, to the factor called PC. PC reflects whether it's going to have one or two replicates. That's the trick, and it works. And it's quite knacky. The permute and objective sets are, uh, are obviously UA, and the uh, link and static sets are null in this case. This is the call um, that we use in ODW, and the only thing that's really worth seeing here or thinking about is what's going on in the permute thing. That's the way that we specify our factor. Uh, that's how we associate a relationship matrix with our variety factor in the data frame, which is the initial data frame called there. And the swap, the swap factor is uh, is provided through that argument there. And so uh, I've specified I'll do 20 taboo, I'll have two, 20 taboo uh, loops for this one. And what do you mean? Well, I don't know, I just picked it. Um, I know, there's more, slightly more to it than that. However, what's really important here is the error variance model for an observation depends on the packet choice. And it's given by that. That's what I just said then. It's either sigma squared equals sigma, sigma squared or sigma. So in order to define a heterogeneous error structure, we, we have to have the initial data frame to be set up such a way uh, that it has, uh, it's ordered on this factor called PC. So the first N1 observations uh, are value one and the next are value two. Okay, stage two um, is we take whatever allocation of uh, varieties to packets uh, we've got, we then expand the data frame out to be the full set of plots. Uh, here, now it's 280 by 1, not 1139, um, and it's done in two steps. The reason why we do it in two steps is because I want the final desire to be resolvable with respect to the major blocking factors, which is achieved in two steps, not just one. Uh, you cannot guarantee uh, resolvability for any, any design if you try and do it in a single step. The permute set here is the total genetic effects, because the breeder wants to select on the total effects. And the variance of these effects is given by the sum of those two matrices. Okay, so for step one, the static effects are simply the large blocking factors, which are trial and cold block, and the effects associated with that variance matrix are given by that. How am I going with this one? I better hurry up. Step two, the static effects are the, uh, now trial, uh, cold block, and column and row. And the swap argument uh, is set to trial uh, by cold block to ensure that the swaps only occur between plots within the intersection of trial and cold block. Hence, once you set up a design which is uh, resolvable in step one, you can then make sure that the, that the ensuing designs that uh, OD finds are resolvable by setting up a swap argument. Very good. That's the code there. I haven't got time to really go into it uh, in detail, but uh, obviously anybody who's interested can look at it. Very quickly to assess the impact of uh, genetic relatedness uh, on uh, on uh, you know on doing what we've just done, what we did is I set up a, a little experiment, and it's a very small experiment where we considered four four treatments, if you like, which were the two by two factorials of using or not using genetic relatedness in both stages. So the design that I've called SG plus plus uses the relatedness in both stages. SG plus minus uses the related the relatedness only in stage one, which means I'm only using relatedness uh, to determine which variety get two reps or one rep. Um, and in the second stage, I'm just doing what we would standardly have done if we didn't have ODW, which, which uses the relatedness in the second stage. So they're the four uh, designs that we generate. The quality of each design was assessed by computing the A value of the design against the correct linear mix model, which means it's got all the static terms and also the, um, the proper model for the two effects. The design with the smallest A value uh, results in um, a design uh, with a higher probability of selecting the best subsets for progression, which is really important, which is what Chris is all about. So the A value expressed as a, uh, as a difference between the best design uh, given there. And it's really interesting to see here that if you don't do either of these steps, then you suffer a penalty. 
And and this this is really exciting. Rita, you're, you're excited. Certainly, I'm excited because this is the first time that people have, uh, or anybody has ever demonstrated that using um, using an informed uh, approach for determining reputation gives you as much um, as doing a nice design with rows and columns and whatever else. So it's a really nice outcome, and uh, it's been repeated over many many uh, examples that we've looked at. Okay, I've got. Not much time left, 15 maybe? 10, 15, 10? Okay, I better go faster. If I can, <laughs> I'll skip to the end. <laughs> oh dear, anyway, I've got 12 slides. I've got 12 slides to go, so I'm doing okay, I think, or thereabouts. Okay, right, this is the multi-phase experiment. So there were 144 plots, 105 varieties in which 39 were replicated and the others were not replicated. The design construction commences uh, by defining the treatment of plot structures. I'm a devotee to Rosemary Bailey. Uh, I teach a design course in honors at Mullingong. And for those, um, Alison and I uh, developed this thing called the design tableau approach, which is a which is a really really useful cool teaching tool for those people who have struggle who struggle to develop linear mixed models for whatever problem. Um, so you can jump on their website and check that out maybe if you're interested. Um, for, for for the first phase. The treatment structure is trivial, so you probably don't need design tableau. So the treatments are just varieties, plot structures, are just uh, coal block, column row, and column dot row are the, are the individual plots. Note that in this example, the requirement for resolvable blocks was met using a single ODW form. So I've just shot myself in the foot before I said we needed two steps. Well, not always. So if you're only blocking in one direction with a large block factor, then OD will find a, a design with his, uh, which is resolvable with respect to coal block with these extra terms in there. So OD, ODW finds incredibly uh, efficient uh, coal, uh, row coal designs. Um, and in an upcoming paper, I've shown that we can match or do better than theoretical uh, results for TLAP9 designs. Okay, application of the design tableau approach uh, for phase two is a lot more complicated. Phase two, as a treatment structure, which is rather uh, diverse. In that, we've got the variety, which is a thing of interest, but we've also got these things which we call linked factors. So we take forward, we take forward all of these associated uh, things from stage one, and they become part of the overall treatment structure. So Rosemary's got a wonderful definition in her book in chapter one and two, which says the treatment structure of an experiment is everything associated with treatments. So in this case, treatments for the second stage really are not only variety, but it's all of those other things which were associated with variety from phase one. And that that gets you that does your head in a bit uh, at first. So the plot structure, well, it's rather perverse and complicated. So day slash run block slash run cross machine slash tube. Construction of an optimal design involves two stages. The first stage is similar to uh, determining the replication status of genotypes, which is used in the chip example. Here, although there's no information on the latter use, the presence of the link factors in the permit set in phase ones provides a convenient mechanism for finding an optimal set of field plots to replicate in phase two. I, I'm super, Alison and I are super excited uh, about this because it's the first time we've ever been able to do this and show that it makes a difference. So the instrument mix model that we use to determine an optimal subset, subset of 40 field plots. So we've got 40 field plots that we can choose to replicate. And so what we do is we set up this pseudo uh, Data vector again, just representing the field plot means, which are mean across laboratory records of length 144. And, and these are these are all the things coming from the first phase. So there's genetic effects, there's column effects, there's row effects, there's block effects, and then there's plot effects, and then there's an error term. And so that has a, a lot of similarity to the previous thing that I did for the chickpea example, except we've got this rather perverse looking uh, extra uh, set of things going on there. And so that error term takes uh, takes the same sort of form as before. We've either got one or two uh, duplicates in the lab. So N1 is 104 and N2 is 40, R1 is one and R2 is two. So as before, we, we take advantage of the identity design matrix for the field plot uh, effect, and we reduce computations for ODW and form a design, uh, combined vector of errors called either star. So the variance of either star is given by that term, which is what we then feed into ODW. And so ODW will then keep swapping things around to minimize the A value uh, for varieties, as you'll see, uh, cognizant of, of that uh, heterogeneous error term. 
And so that's all achieved in that call there. And um, I, won't, I haven't got time to go into it. And others can uh, I'll make these slides available, obviously. And so that's, that's how we achieve it. Um, just reiterating here. Uh, sorry, what am I doing? Oh, yeah. So reiterating here. So what we've got here, this is some really, really cool features of OVW. Well, I think it's really cool. This is what Dave's come up with, or Dave and I, maybe, and Alison. But anyway, so in green, we've got uh, the commute uh, factors, and we're commuting um, all those things that's all being commuted together. So they're all sitting in W1, this design of W1, okay? And they're being commuted together. However, these things after the uh, pipe are the linked uh, factors. The thing before that is the, is the uh, objective factor. And so that's really cool, but there's another twist because field plot is actually sitting in the residual. So therefore it's totally alias with the, uh, you know, with the error term. However, to ensure that the final design that comes out of ODW is consistent with the field design, we can reorder the field plot uh, factor, which, is, uh, which then aligns that with the permutation vector, which uh, the final permutation vector, which OD settles on after 10, uh, 10 taboo searches. Sure. All right. Um, where are we? Okay, stage two. Stage two, so we take, we can then do the same sort of trick as before. We then, um, we then just uh, feed in a, a linear mix model. This time the linear mix model has a treatment structure which is given by that. The plot structure now is this full plot structure of days and run, run, runs and uh, machines and tubes. And we do two steps here, okay? The two steps that we do um, are to ensure that we get resolvability with respect to uh, day and maybe machine. Okay, so we start off with this design. Uh, this is our initial design. So field reps, varieties of only available well, one plot or two plots. And uh, PC is the replication status that we had from before. Okay, um, will I do that or will I not do that? Um, Oh yeah, so this is step one where we try and look for resolvability for day and machine. So we haven't got the whole uh, mixed model in yet. So we're just trying to uh, find a design which is which is resolvable for variety um, using the day uh, using uh, day and machine. What did I say here? No, that's all right. No, that's all right. Sorry. Okay. Right, so the, the design was resolved for machine and day, and that was used as the initial start, uh, design in step 2.2. Three designs were created in, in, in 2.2. Each used a different model for the SOP formula in order to investigate the impact on the A-optimality of the final design on the restrictions imposed by resolvability. One thing that, I, that we've become very, very uh, aware of is that the result is the optimality of the design can be uh, severely impacted if you restrict the design space to be only um, allowing slots which are permissible within, for example, the uh, within the intersection between days and machines. Um, and so what we did here is to just uh, illustrate how you do get uh, an impact in terms of a, a value. We tried three different slot um, arguments. One which was the resolvability for days and machines. One was days only and one was null. And we ran those to, to thousands and thousands of taboos to make sure that we got to where we wanted to get to. Okay, and so that's the call. That's the call that we use, which is an absolute nightmare. Okay, I'm not going to. Well, will I show? You? Yeah, that that again shows this 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 uh, lovely uh, feature of OD where you've got the link set uh, behind the pipe and you've got varieties there. Okay. All right. Okay. The A values for the three designs were those three numbers there, demonstrating the penalty which uh, which occurs with the restrictions for resolvability. So the, the, the lowest A value was the last one, okay? That last design had no uh, restrictions on resolvability. That first one has uh, restrictions on resolvability uh, for a day and machine, whereas this one's just day, okay? And so we, we had a chat to the breeder and we, uh, we decided that we would only go, we'd only go with um, resolvability for days, which is basically that number B. So that's, that's the design that we, we landed on. So we adopted that after discussion with the researcher. To examine the benefits of choosing field plots to replicate our method, we generated three designs. We used the plot structure for phase one, which is our method, which is design one. We used ODW, but without the plot factors. 
Okay, so it's a simplified uh, version. And that really is just telling OD, ODW then finds uh, the optimal design will be the fill plots from varieties because you've only got one, one plot. So we only replicate those, but we don't just we don't worry about where they have occurred in the field. They may all occur, they may just by chance occur in one area of the uh, in one column or one row. And then the last choice was at random, which is obviously silly. The quality of each design was assessed by com computing the A value of the design. The A values for each design were given by these three numbers, which is incredibly exciting. I only produced those yesterday. And I'm super, super impressed as is Allison that D1 produces by far, not, not that far, but certainly measurably uh, better A value uh, than, than certainly just using a naive approach of replicating those varieties you know, that have only got uh, duplicators in the lab. So, to that is a really cool way. I don't believe it's been done before. I'm sure it hasn't been done. A wrap up, I've got, I've got minus one, one minute, I believe. So, all of this work is really just a precursor towards what excites me more than anything else is and also excites breeders is towards the development of, of these i met designs um i've just been interviewed by a journalist and you know you always hate when you know, journalists want to interview about something anyway i did find a quote in there which i thought was rather cool it was based on a paper that we published last year this year so christy and myself and some other people published a paper and in that paper we showed that we've been able to reduce uh time the breeding cycle time, which means the time that it takes a breeder to make a cross to the time that, that something from that cross is released to farmers, takes about eight years. So it's an incredibly slow process. Using these model environment trial designs has shaved about two years off the breeding cycle, which is amazing. Because that means it's an amazing flow on effect to farmers. Everybody wins. You get higher genetic gain, you get faster release of better varieties, farmers win, everybody wins, and it's really exciting, and hence, hence that's the reason why they wanted to do a story on it, because it is incredibly exciting. And um, yeah, and so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of sharp types. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm looking for thank you very much for um a super great talk okay um is there any question from the audience i'll take first uh, question like here and then go online sorry okay. <laughs> i'm in your way here sorry yeah. and i just asked something about the tabu tabu algorithm just a quick question about the tableau algorithm. Was, if, if you don't use that, I imagine that was an intractable problem because the, the space is, is so it really cuts down a lot, a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is, yeah, is there a simple, a, a simple explanation why, what, what, it, what it does? Well, uh, look, that's my, not my area of expertise. That's, I should let Dave answer that question. But essentially, it just, it just keeps a record of any design that's been, been visited before. And so it's it's really, really uh, very efficient in terms of, um, so it does a complete exhaustive search, but it keeps a track of those designs, which is hence the reason for taboo, because it create it keeps a taboo list of designs that it's already visited. And then it, it accepts the design, you know, if it's better in terms of A value, but it also has a stochastic element to it. And so that avoids it getting stuck in local. So, so it can get away from local minima. And so sometimes it actually, you can set um, some tuning constants in there which Dave's got in there, where you can jump out of these uh, these local minima and you can search, you can keep searching. So you jump out of a, you know, what potentially could be a local minima and you go further you know, you know, in your search, yeah? It's been shown, it was originally, um, it was originally devised in the operations research area for the uh, traveling traveling salesman problem, in fact, uh, which you may or may not be aware of. But if you, if you do know a little bit about uh, operations research, then that's where it was originally um, proposed and developed. And, it was. Uh, it's. It's now used in these uh, design problems quite a lot. It's. It's quite a reliable. Um, Dave's got a few other hooks in there. A few other different uh, search algorithms as well as the taboo, taboo plus random walk, uh, which is the one that I was using there, which I find uh, seems to get there very quickly. It's really useful. You can tune these algorithms when you do actually have a design problem where you know, you know the uh, lower bound, 
because then because then you can keep searching and searching and searching and you can fiddle around and you can fine tune some of these tuning constants and it's really helpful to do that these are these designs that we've got here all these designs i've presented today unfortunately we don't know we don't have any lower bounds because we've got correlated trim effects or we've got complex uh, multi-phase you know, so it's just uh, we don't have an option there so you just keep spinning the wheel <laughs> and hope that you've you've um, done a pretty exhaustive search because there's the design space is huge yeah. which is which is kind of fun kind of fun from a computational point of view these are all very this is very very quick uh, odw can run like the wind it really is very fast using uh, our uh, updating formula that dave and i developed yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, following what the other gentleman just asked, how does it actually store the results of each iteration? Because you say it doesn't do what it's done before. How does it actually store that? You have to ask Dave that. He's got some uh, really, really nice, uh, it's a really, really clever thing that he does. He's, that he does it in a very, very succinct manner. Look, you have to ask Dave for that. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't put my head under the bonnet of ODW. It's a bit scary. So I tend to I tend to come up with these off of the wall, bizarre, crazy uh, ways of doing designs. And then Dave comes up with the amazing code to do them. So, well, um, if I Dave, say, can, you, can you help can me? I, out? <laughs> can I just say quickly, um, basically what it does, it, it encapsulates the permutation vector uh, uh, you turn yourself up, Dave. Sorry, I may not have myself. Well, he's in Queensland, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've got a volume control on this on the microphone. Uh, it encodes oh. the entire. Um, hold on, hold on, Dave. Hold on, Dave. Uh, I think Clara's going to turn you up somewhere. Oh, no, that seems a promise that I may not be able to maintain. Um, where's the centrum? Where's, where's the centrum? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Try, try, David. Can you speak again? Speak again. Uh, is, that, is that any better? Maybe try again. Hang on. I'll try this. Does that help? Yeah. No? Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, what a lot of trouble for a simple answer. Um, all it really does is uh, encode the entire permutation vector into a simple number, like a single number, like a. Uh, one of those checks you get when you, you download a file, for example, at the end of it, it's, it's got a single checksum. Uh, I just grab an algorithm off the internet, and um, there are several ways to do taboo. Uh, some keep various uh, records of where it's last visited. Um, some people suggested that keeping basically the solution, if you like, uh, is, is also a pretty good way to do it. Um, clearly, storing a whole swag of uh, p vectors of rather large size um, was a bit. Uh, a bit of, uh, of an overhead, so um, uh, I just encoded into a, a single 64-bit number, basically. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that Amy online has a question. Um, is there any plan to release it to Prime? Is it well, I better throw that over to DB. DB's the man. Sorry, hey, what, was the, what was the question? Hey, when are you When are you planning to release this to Cran? Oh, well, uh, when we've probably finished with our friends in uh, Europe that we're working with at the moment. Yeah, we've just signed a, um, we just signed a contract with a plant breeding company based, well, it's a worldwide plant breeding company. It's very exciting. They've just um, signed a contract with us to develop ODW further. And part of the, um, part of the contract um, uh, requires Dave to produce a CRAN version. Because that's good, because he's a, he's a very, very shy chap. And, he, uh, and so he's not really keen to show his like the code off to the world for some reason. I don't know why. So um, so anyway, so part of the contract will be to develop a, a CRAN, which will be in the next, what were the milestones? Four months, five months, Dave? Six months or something? Uh, I'll be first, first quarter next year, I would say. Yep. Any other question? Any I actually had a question about like what Armando asked. So do you have, I don't, I'm not sure if I can, should I probably they can, you can hear me from online, but like, do you have examples, like practical examples where you know the lower, the lower bound? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in the paper that we've, uh, so we're at the, at the minute, we're burying away writing the paper and I've, we've taken a lot of these things from the paper, um, which hopefully we'll submit in the next month or so. But in, uh, one of the examples I didn't give today was, 
was a textbook example, which was in um, Emblem and uh, Nye John's beautiful book on cyclic designs. It's a lovely book. Um, hats off to Emblem and Nye John, who are lovely people, uh, very smart chaps. So we take some of their two Latinized rocon designs and about three examples, I think, in the paper. And so, yeah, we demonstrate how to produce those designs, which are classical designs, um, using ODW. And yeah, and, and I think I, I think we match, I think we match uh, two of them. And in fact, we beat uh, one of them. Mm -hmm. Once you talk about you know, three hours to do it, but it's all right. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem with these uh, taboo search algorithms. You really do not know. Sometimes it's very slightly bizarre, and maybe we should. Have, you know, obviously we've discussed having multiple starts and you know, sometimes you do need multiple starts and that sort of thing. Anyway, um, so it's kind of handy to fine tune your algorithm against um, designs where you do know the optimum, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know the, the low bounds, yeah. So it's, so it's kind of fun, yeah. However, most of our design problems don't have that sort of luxury, yeah. yeah. All right, sorry, another question. But, uh, I was a bit surprised with your excitement of, uh, of the final numbers that you had for eight. They're very small, aren't they? The, it, yeah, but but it, apparently, like the improvement, reducing eight years to two years is like a big impact. So, oh yeah, well, that, these are not my words. These weren't my words. These were these were Christy Hobson's and my colleagues. They're, they're just super excited because what they can do. The reason why um, the article goes into reasons, but I'll just give you a very quick summary. So these incomplete metasigns, um, really, really critical. You know, there's a thing uh, that kills everybody in Australia. All the plant breeders. Which is what which is what we call variety by environment interaction, which which basically means that the performance of the variety depends on the environment, and it, and so one variety could be the best in that environment, and it could be not so good in that environment, and so breeders are very cognizant of that issue, and so it's really critical early on in the testing uh, uh, program to spread them across as many environments as you can to get some some essential feel for uh, varieties that are high performing across a range of environments varieties that might be adapted to a specific type of environment and so on. So these model environment trial designs that uh, I've developed um, with Dave and Nelson, and uh, they, um, they are using a, a, an informed way to spread the material across um, the different environments in a sensible manner. And you've got all sorts of constraints because some varieties only had enough seed for one, for one, whereas you had seven sites and each site has multiple plots. And so it's a really, really cool problem to deal with. So, and this 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 idea has been used by, oh, I don't know how many breeding companies now, um, all over Australia and, and all around the world. And uh, and I haven't published it. I've had the idea for maybe eight years and I've never got around to publishing it. However, I've been refining it uh, over and over and over over the last few years because Dave's made some huge gains in uh, ODW, which has allowed me to do uh, much, much more clever things. So yeah, and the breeders have been trying these ideas out and they can see how valuable it is because they are they're able to spread things across so that not every variety occurs in every environment, but you get linkages through the genetic relatedness, which is really cool because that's that's the key. Um, the the genetic relatedness really does link everything, if you know what I mean. It it allows you to test full sisters and full brothers at different places and then put all, put all that together, you know, pulls that together in a meta-analysis effectively. So for those people who understand clinical trials or that sort of thing you know a meta-analysis is what we call a model environment trial analysis so we're just putting trials together in a meta-analysis here and so Alison's uh, PhD was on that sort of stuff and, um, and so we routinely use those things every year so it's really cool to have a good design which spreads you as far as you can go um, sure. Until Brian had this idea, oh, here we go. Um, breeders would only use maybe three environments and try and put all the varieties in that, uh, those three environments. So what Brian's come up with allows them to actually use six environments instead of three yeah. and just spread the varieties more thinly, if you like. Yeah, no, no. The classical thing was to do what people would call a complete MET design, where they would just have enough seed to do two sites and two reps at each site. So you're only sampling two environments and you don't have to be too clever to think, well, if there's a G by E variance component, well, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get uh, great accuracy by doing that. So I thought, well, that's silly. So let's come up with a way to spread the things as far as we can and as wide as we can, but linking the environments uh, using relatedness. So you're linking, it's pulling it all together. So you're borrowing strength through the through the dependence between the treatment groups. You know. And so that's how it works, and, and it's phenomenal how how it 
it just gives them so much more confidence. I can really, really fast track uh, lines through, yeah. Um, even with small amounts of seed, and that's what Christy, that's what Christy was, uh, well, she's besotted with it, and so are all the other breeders, they're all so excited because it, it breaks the shackles of traditional, you know, balanced designs, you know, blah, blah, you know, and, and, and it's silly from a statistical point of view to only sample a small number of environments, yeah. So it's, it, you sort of think, oh, well, like all things, when you thought of an idea, you think it's pretty trivial, which it is, but <laughs> I suppose the trick is to think of it in the first place and then have the tools to generate designs, yeah. So. Any other question? I think I've got some line, there is nothing. Okay, so, well, let me thank again, Brian, to be with us tonight. And uh, I would like to thank um, everyone who came here in person or online. Um, our next seminar is on the 9th of November um, and will be advertised soon. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you all uh, on the 9th of November. And I also would like to say that um, we also have uh, um, the, uh, our annual, annual lectures together with the JB Douglas Award on the 5th of December. And our annual lecture is the Marika Batero, uh, again from Wollongo. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you again, Brian, for being with us tonight. Thank you so much.